Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of professional wrestling. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good. Thanks, Connie. I'm doing good. Ready to go today. Should be a good show. Covering one of my favorite guys and topics, Glenn Jacobs, AKA Kane. So should be a fun show today. No doubt about it. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's a long time coming. It's hard to believe that he debuted as this character just over 25 years ago. Where does the time go? But boy, know. it was quite a story getting there. It'd be one thing if he just showed up and he was Kane, the undertaker's brother and had this great backstory, but as with so many other characters in wrestling, boy, it took a long twisty road to get there. Uh, and that long twisty road will have you in Wichita this Saturday for collision. We've got, uh, a big show lined up. I'm sure uh, tickets are on sale now, as I understand it at AEWTIX.com. And I guess we're going to be discussing the 69 day championship of the acclaimed and daddy ass. So wow. a, lot, a lot of fun moving parts in <laughs> AEW. Uh, of course this past weekend, you guys had what most people felt like was a pay-per-view main event on free TV, MJF and Kenny Omega. You've called so many of these guys, classic matches. I mean, Kenny Omega, even going back to the new Japan days, what'd you think of their performance this past Saturday? I thought it was an outstanding match. Quite frankly, it told a good story, made sense, uh, hard work. It just was a really good story. I thought being told and, uh, and I enjoyed calling it. I was happy to be there. Uh, it certainly was a, a fun match to watch, but, uh, MJF and, and, uh, Kenny delivered and it's, uh, they had a lot of pressure on them, obviously. Those expectations of that match were very high. So, uh, I was all good. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, I thought it was a great outing for those dudes. I think you're going to be impressed with what you see this weekend to go see AEW in person, see the voice of wrestling in person, AEWTIX.com. today. Of course, it's all about the man they call the mayor. Well, once upon a time, he was the man called Kane. Of course, we're talking about Glenn Jacobs. It's just hard to imagine that I said 25, I guess it's been 26 years since he was making his debut as that character. That was 97. Well, back in 1947, he was born in Madrid, Spain. This happens because his dad was a member of the United States air force. One day he's going to look into uh, teaching and he actually earns a teaching degree before he decides to get into pro wrestling. And I, for one, am glad maybe he never told Vince McMahon that because we didn't need Glenn Jacobs as Dean Douglas. We had tried a Dean Douglas and a teacher gimmick probably wasn't going to work in the WWE. Probably not. You know, he, 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 he got on the right road earlier, early enough to, to make it work. So, uh, he was a can't miss guy. I mean, you know, smart, uh, he was just a. Right place, right time. And he was a, one of the best signees I ever, I ever had the opportunity to, to sign up. He was just a, just tremendous. And he still is a tremendous guy. I mean, he's what he's doing for his community as a mayor, uh, is, uh, ex, ex, is great. Uh, so yeah, he's Glenn Jacobs is a keeper in many, on many fronts and a great credit to his community. He winds up being trained to become a professional wrestler by both Dean Malenko and Ray candy. And he's actually going to spend some time in Puerto Rico, Japan, and Florida during the early nineties, but he's going to spend a considerable amount of time in Memphis and boy, we try some silly gimmicks with Glenn Jacobs here in Memphis, the Christmas creature, or he's dressed up like a doggone Christmas tree. Yeah. Doomsday. But you know, as with every other big guy who came through, uh, Memphis, he had a chance to work with Jerry Lawler on top in December of 1992. I assume that somewhere around here is when he would have been on your radar. When do you first remember of hearing about Glenn Jacobs? About this time, about this time, you know, you can't overlook a guy that's that big, that athletic, uh, high, high intellect, a man of character. Uh, he was, uh, he just had to get there and, uh, and, and he did quite easily. Great abilities. Great, great. Uh, he just was, 
I, it, just, it wasn't a matter of if he was going to be successful. It's just a matter of when and where and how, because he was a, he was a can't miss guy. He was a can't miss guy and WCW saw that they actually used him in early 1993. Uh, he would, um, wrestle as bruiser Mastino in a, in a, I guess an enhancement match against sting. And then later that same year, October of 93, he gets his opportunity to work for the WWF. This time it's a dark match during a TV taping or before a TV taping where he'll work Mike bell who a lot of you have probably heard the name from, from bigger, faster, stronger, that documentary a couple of decades ago, this dark match happens in Burlington, Vermont, and he's going to wrestle as Glenn Jacobs in this affair. Later on, on this show, we would see Bret Hart defeat Jerry Lawler in a steel cage match. And there's even going to be interference by Owen Hart and the black Knight, which is actually being portrayed by Glenn Jacobs. And of course we were originally thinking Glenn Jacobs could be one of these guys to be one of the Knights in the upcoming survivor series match there in 1993. And Bruce Pritchard had this to say about early Glenn Jacobs. Glenn was greener than grass. Glenn was greener than the Christmas tree outfit that he wore as the Christmas creature in Tennessee, which was hilarious. Every time that picture would surface, we would put it up all around the dressing room for the Christmas creature, which was a green unitard from head to toe with tinsel and balls hanging down from it. He was just very <laughs> green. We had to get him some more experience before we could get him in but we liked his size and there was potential. Plus he was a super nice guy. There was something there, but we just didn't have a developmental system. We didn't have a school. So we sent him to Memphis where he had an opportunity to work every day. He was going to be one of the nights under the mask. He didn't become a knight because he was too green, just way too green. Not even a year in the business at that time. I think we brought him up here though, because we needed bodies, but we just didn't know. We didn't know how green he was at that point. And I guess that's really a blessing because sometimes we hear this story too often. It can be too much too soon in wrestling, right? Jim. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's that happens all the time. And, uh, but he, he was the kind of guy that could sort it all out, uh, work his way through the muddled mess of breaking into pro wrestling because he was just so damn smart. And he knew what was going on. He knew this, his surroundings. So, uh, he, he was, like I said earlier, he's just a can't miss guy. You can't, you can't say enough about a guy that's that big, that athletic and has that much character. He had everything that was needed to be a, a successful pro wrestler. And the fact that he was, you know, getting close to that seven foot mark and being very athletic, uh, didn't hurt his cause whatsoever. I really enjoy, uh, his story because even though he gets sent down to Memphis and he toughs it out there for more than a year, come January of 95, he's hired by Jim Cornette's smoky mountain wrestling. That's where he'll be repackaged using the name Unibomb. And he's going to go on the team with the likes of Eddie Gilbert and Al snow before finally getting the feud with the rock and roll express. You want to talk about a crash course in professional wrestling working under the watchful eye of Jim Cornette alongside guys like Eddie Gilbert, who had a great mind for the business, Al snow, who was incredible in the ring and the rock and roll express boy, by this point, they've forgotten more about wrestling than most people will ever know. Yep. And this biggest opportunity comes in August of 95. Uh, there's a smoky mountain wrestling super bowl of wrestling event. And he winds up wrestling the undertaker. Now this is important because this is a time where Lawler has obviously a great relationship with the WWF. The WWF is loaning them big name talent to come down for some of their super shows. They're blessed with the presence of the undertaker. And this is a real opportunity for Glenn Jacobs to show off what his skills are, uh, I guess one of the most iconic big men in the history of the business. That's one of those times where you have to, as you like to say, maximize your minutes. No. Oh yeah. And the, the, the fact that, uh, Glenn always, uh, anointed himself very well. He, he undertaker liked him and that was as big a, as a, that was as big a good thing to happen to Glenn as there was taker enjoyed working with uh, Glenn Jacobs. He enjoyed being around him. And so that gave, uh, Glenn the opportunity 
uh, to quickly move up the ladder because he had ingratiated himself with arguably uh, the biggest star in WWE and a guy that physically matched up with, uh, with Glenn very well, size wise, philosophically wise and so forth. So, uh, Glenn was a very, uh, teachable character and, uh, and did a great job of getting himself ready, uh, for the next step. Well, he credits you with a lot of his success here. Kane wrote in his book, one guy I owe a lot to, of course, is Jim Ross. Jim Ross was on hiatus with WWE, but he was working as Jim Cornette's announcer within a month or two. And of course, Jim Ross likes big guys. Immediately. He got me a tryout with the WWE. I was so super excited. And you wrote in your book about this. Glenn was Unibom with a mask. He had that great look. He was college educated, soft-spoken and classy. I thought if Vince could see this guy, he would want him on his roster underneath that size and potential. Glenn immediately struck me as a model employee. I knew it would be a benefit to both Glenn and Vince to meet up someday. This is just you just playing matchmaker with two guys who, you know, should be in business together, right? Pretty much. Yeah. I, I saw no way that we could fail with Glenn if we move forward with it. And he continued to apply himself and he did. Uh, and you know, he just was a, he was a workhorse. He knew what he wanted to do and he was reliable. So I was a, I was a big fan of Glenn from the get go. And, uh, it never, he never disappointed and still doesn't. Well, he has a tryout match with Reno Riggins. This happens February 20th, 1995. It's a raw taping. And Kane would write, of course, Reno was a great worker. And within literally a couple of days, Jim Cornette talks to me and says, they're going to sign me and that they want me. I was really excited and thought this is exactly what I wanted to do. I received a phone call to meet with Vince McMahon. And at the time, JJ was the head of talent relations. They take me to the office in Stanford, Connecticut, sitting in a room with Vince or with JJ and Vince walks in. We're sitting there just having small talk and everything is going well. And Vince asked me if I was ever afraid to go to the dentist. I'm thinking this is one of those things where I'm going through a personality test. So I said, no, sir. He said, well, he always had this idea for a wrestling dentist, Isaac Yankum. That's I Yankum DDS from Decatur. <laughs> had you heard of Vince's idea of an evil dentist before? Glenn Jacobs comes aboard. Yeah, but I didn't think he was serious about it. Right. I didn't, I didn't know how serious Vince was about, uh, creating the evil dentist character. Uh, but he was serious. He was dead serious about it. And it wasn't a bad idea. I mean, the, the visuals of Glenn, Glenn's teeth and all those things were, uh, uh, marketable quite honestly. So, uh, no, I, I, I wasn't sure how serious Vince was on that idea. But he was damn sure he was damn serious. And, uh, so off we went. Off we went is an understatement. Um, we know that, you know, you're going to have to go through creative services and understand more about what exactly Vince is looking for. And this is the era of, I guess it's been called occupational gimmicks. You know, maybe we need a little more believability. We don't need characters like the ultimate warrior. What is that? We need characters like a pig farmer and a garbage man and, <laughs> and a hockey player and a dentist, uh, Kane would write in his book here. I am sitting on my, the top of the world, but now it feels like the world is falling down on me. A wrestling dentist. I'm not going to pull this off. I spoke with Jim Cornette and told him, I didn't know about this whole dentist thing. And he says to me, oh, it'll be fine. That's just his first thought. They will eventually come up with something cool. Two months later, I spoke with Cornette and he's working in creative with WWE. And he tells me the good news is you're going to be coming up really soon. The bad news is you are coming up as the dentist. And I'm thinking, oh man, what am I going to do? If I wanted to advance my career, basically I had to take a shot and it just yep. got worse. They had me paint my teeth. So it made it look like my teeth were in decay. Everyone else had this cool music and I had this drill and I'm thinking, golly, I just wasn't ready to do it. 
And listen, this is a testament to Glenn, because I think a lot of people could have thrown the flag on this and, and proven themselves to be, as you like to say, unreliable or difficult to work with, but instead he went out and he ran the play as silly as it was, but I feel like there's some talent who have done that. And again, I'm on the outside looking in. I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but we've seen some silly gimmicks that work and then the guys or don't work. And the guys never really get a shot again. You know, guys like Muhammad Hassan thought he went and ran the play. I and mean, this is really an Italian guy. He's not really from Iraq or Iran or Saudi Arabia or whatever. He's Italian and we're going to put him in this gimmick and he's going to pull it off and it gets over. But then, uh, when things don't go exactly how everybody would hope we send him back down developmental for a cup of coffee and then it's over. He's out of there. What, what separates, you know, the decision-making process from, I got to run the play to, Hey, I need to push back on this a little bit, or is that even possible? Oh, I guess it's possible, but you know, you don't want to defy the audience and Vince's, uh, uh, logic and his, his idea too, but too, uh, aggressively. So, uh, but it was such a unique gimmick, you know, the wrestling, the evil wrestling dentist. Uh, was uh, something that we had not experimented with before. So, uh, it was all new ground. How was it going to work out? So that's kind of, we were all kind of waiting to see how that was going to be accepted by the audience. And that's really where it starts. Did he, did the audience show any desire to invest emotionally in this character? It has seemed like they did, but Glenn's, uh, appearance, Glenn's whole makeup was unique and different. So, uh, it was still yet to be, re- to be determined if the dentist gimmick was going to get over and uh, luckily for all involved, it, it did. And, and for the most part, man, it's, uh, it's such an interesting story to show how dedicated he is and how persistent he is and how committed he was. And in a lot of ways, you know, this wasn't the original idea, but he's going to make it work. Yeah. That reminds me of those folks over at Henson shaving. You see, they're a family owned business and their original plan was to make parts for the international space station and the Mars Rover. Yeah. They're an aerospace parts manufacturer, but somewhere along the way, they said to themselves, self, what if we use some of these aerospace grade CNC machines to cut some metal razors? I wonder how thin we could get them. And we got our answer. They can get them 0.0013 inches thin. Now, how thin is that? Well, it's thinner than a human hair. And what that means is a more secure and a stable blade with a more vibration free shave. You see the fewer vibrations there are in your shave, the less likely you are to get nicks and cuts and scrapes. So this is going to give you the best shave of your life. The technology has guaranteed that not only that, this razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream which is going to make clogging virtually impossible. You see, these cats wanted to make the best razor, not necessarily the best razor business. The best razor business might be a razor made out of plastic with some proprietary blades and some planned obsolescence. Maybe they even hook you up with some sort of gimmicky subscription. That's not what they do here with Henson. This works with a classic double-sided blade, like every wrestler's familiar with, but the thinnest razors you've ever seen. That's what Henson provides for you. So they're going to make sure that you get the old school feel, but the benefits of new school tech and boy, is it affordable? It's only three to $5, not three to $5 a shave, not three to $5 a month, not three to $5 a quarter, three to $5 a year to replace those blades. And normally when something costs more, we expect that to be better. It's rare that we find something that's better and yet somehow more affordable. Henson shaving has figured out how to do that. So let's say no to subscriptions and let's say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshavingcom slash JR to pick the razor for you and use the code JR to make sure you get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash JR and use our code JR. So Kane also wrote a lot about the undertaker and how really he's taken Glenn under his wing here. Uh, in hindsight, can you ask for a better setup like that? than your, your a big man trying to 
bring along your other new big men. Hell no. I yeah. mean, that's a dream come true. If you're Glenn Jenkins, it's a, you know, you couldn't book it any better. I don't think undertaker took a liking to, to, to Glenn. Uh, he knew Glenn had tremendous upside. Uh, he liked to be coached. So it was a, it was a match made in heaven and it came at the right place at the right time. That's one of those crazy wrestling deals, right place, right time. And so all of a sudden there's a big old Glenn. He's ready to go young athletic. And he's a great listener. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, I was a big, big proponent of undertaker's relationship with Glenn. Here's the deal folks. Glenn Jacobs would not have been the star that he became the hall of famer that he became. If it weren't for undertaker undertaker was the difference in Glenn being a success or not. And so for whatever success Glenn, uh, earned over the years, certainly his uh, relationship, with undertaker was a major, uh, major get it helped immensely. So, uh, I'm, uh, I was very, that, that, that was the difference maker undertaker saw something in Glenn. I don't know if he's how far down the road. He saw it, but he saw Glenn as somebody special and more importantly for taker, a potential opponent. And, and we were running short on viable opponents for the undertaker. And we found one big time. No doubt you did. And, uh, of course he's going to debut as this Isaac Yankum character. He's going to be Jerry, the King Lawler's dentist. This is on the heels of Brett shoving Jerry's foot in his mouth and King of the ring 95. It's a big role for Glenn. And it even allows a SummerSlam 95 match against Bret Hart. Uh, he even main events a Monday night raw against Brett in October. This time it's in a steel cage match where Brett gets the win and the program ends when he teams with Lawler and they lose to Brett and Hakushi on Monday night raw. And you very quickly see Yankum put taker over on Monday night raw in January of 1996. And they're going to start heavily downplaying his character on TV. And he even loses to the ultimate warrior in one of his final appearances. So listen, he starts out this thing working with Jerry Lawler, who's a, a staple on television at the time. He gets some matches with Bret Hart, who's the top guy and the on again, off again champion. I mean, this is pretty rarefied air. And even though it is going to be essentially an enhancement match, he's working with another top guy in the ultimate warrior, but you can tell, you know, once this whole storyline of foot in the mouth, and now we've got to go see a dentist. Where do we go from there with this character? Right? I mean, I, I understood it made sense in that story, but it's hard to fit a dentist into any other storylines now. Yeah, it's challenging. It's challenging, but we saw what we needed to see. We saw a big talented athlete that could, uh, you know, could clear the hurdles. Shall we say, uh, had a, had a lot of potential, great attitude and you can't coach size. Yes. Athletic big men draw money for whatever reason they always have. I think that they always will. And Glenn certainly fit, fit into that category quite easily, quite comfortably. And, uh, I don't think anybody believed that the, the evil dentist was the end game, the end, the, you know, the, the end of it all, there was still more there to, to utilize with the athlete that was almost seven feet tall, very athletic, uh, had, a, had that proverbial mean streak and, uh, and he had that beautiful size. So, uh, I don't think any of us thought that, okay, the dentist is the end all be all, but, uh, what is, well, with a guy like Glenn, you're always going to know something's going to happen because he had too much potential for it not to. Well said, we know that, uh, he's going to have to be a little persistent with this next idea too, because once the dentist gimmick is retired, well, we know that he's reliable. We know that he is. On the upswing, we want to keep him with the Jersey. What do we have him do? Well, as you probably recall in the spring of 96 diesel and razor sort of fly the coop down South and somewhere along the way, they create their own razor and diesel again in the WWF Meltzer would say this, of course, there was far more to a weekend where the WWF created a story of razor Ramon and diesel returning 
as an attempt that wound up basically failing to try and get ratings in the Monday night battle that the company has consistently lost and running an angle that became the top item of interest in the company, thus overwhelming its hype for the coming pay-per-view show, whatever comparatively small amount of revenue they generated on their 900 line by creating a top angle with a negative reaction payoff to the fans who were teased at the box office, either on pay-per-view or at the arenas paled with the amount of money they left on the table by not promoting their September 22nd pay-per-view well. So of course this is the fall of 1996. Now when we're introducing this, that September pay-per-view would be that incredible mind game show with Shawn Michaels and mankind on top. What can you tell us about, cause you're going to be a big part of this when you were first pitched the idea, cause I think it was actually Jerry McDivitt who's credited with the idea of saying, you know, technically you still own razor Ramon and diesel. Those are just characters that are a part of your IP. And now we're going to find two new guys to portray it. What'd you think of that? So, so I was lukewarm on it. To be honest with you. Uh, didn't see how it was going to work long term. but here's the thing it did. Conrad, it kept, it kept, uh, Glenn on the map. Yes. It kept Glenn, uh, on the radar and whether that was going to work or something else was going to work. The bottom line was, is that Glenn wasn't forgotten and pushed aside. He st- whether it was a great gimmick or not a great gimmick. He stayed on television more often than not. And that's what gave him his, uh, that was his best, uh, feature. Vince liked him. Uh, the boys liked him. Guys like to work with him. Uh, and again, you can't coach seven feet, 300 pounds. Nope. Uh, a friend of ours used to say you can't teach that. Uh, so listen, we know that it's obvious. Glenn Jacobs has more of the body profile of a Kevin Nash than a Scott Hall. So he's going to become for lack of a better word, fake diesel. Yeah. It's a Friday night, raw championship Friday, where you guys have been preempted and it's a much ballyhooed special headline by Shawn Michaels and gold dust on the USA network and quote, this is from the observer. Jim Ross had the biggest news story of his 20 year career and would reveal it on the hotline. Instead of doing so, he later revealed in the show that razor Ramon and diesel were negotiating to return to the WWF. He said he'd have more details on the hotline and there would be more information over the weekend on mania action zone and raw. I wonder how much money that made. I wonder how, how that hotline did financially. Yeah. That'd be good to know. Wouldn't it? I'm curious. Yeah. I'm just, just curious. There's nothing. I'm not looking for a a belated pay, a payday, (coughs) but I'm, uh, just curious as to how that paid off because he got a lot of promotion and the hotline had proven to be a money generator when done correctly and had the right topic. So, uh, I don't know. I, I just was curious. I never did hear in all these years, how well it did, uh, on uh, doing how well it did 900 number wise revenue wise. Be curious to know. Interesting. Well, Meltzer says on the hotline, which no doubt did near record business, Ross basically said negotiations were taking place and he got this information from his best source. Well, despite hype to the contrary, there were no updates on either mania or action zone as both shows are taped the previous Tuesday and Vince didn't even come up with this angle until Thursday, which at that point, very few in Titan were clued in what was going on. And most in the company were stunned by Ross's announcement on the show. I know this is a little silly because we're talking about pro wrestling. No, but I know that you have taken your job very, very seriously. And anyone who has read your books or heard you talk knows that you went about your business in a very serious manner. And it's reminiscent of like a, a Lance Russell or a Gordon Soley, where they had credibility with the audience. And now you're kind of crossing over into becoming a character here. Were you at all concerned that this would hurt your credibility in wrestling? Or do you think credibility in wrestling is just sort of LOL who cares? No, I don't think it's LOL whatsoever. I just think that, uh, uh, it was going to be up to me to pull this thing off. Uh, and, uh, that's what I did my best to do, but, uh, no, I didn't have any. I didn't have any issues with, with, with tweaking my role. I think that's important that all of us, uh, uh, be willing to change 
and I think that's kind of what JR's character did. It just, I became more a part of the show, uh, than I was when I was just calling headlocks and hammerlocks. Let's talk a little bit about, um, what could have been, because I have to admit the way I thought you introduced them and almost felt like you were sort of low key taking credit for their return. Do you think there was ever a discussion that you might actually become the on-screen manager for these two? I don't know, maybe casually, but I don't think it was, uh, of a serious intent. I don't think Vince ever had the idea to take his uh, number one play by play guy off television, uh, and create him as a quasi manager. I don't think Vince ever had that idea. My, my role as a, a on air guy was more important than, uh, than trying to be a manager because I wasn't going to go on the road. I wasn't going to, I didn't have the schedule. My schedule was not going to be amenable, uh, for, uh, for that manager role. I don't think I'd have been very good at it. You know, who the hell wants to start taking bumps in their thirties. So, uh, I didn't, but I was, I wanted to help Glenn. So that's what I did. That was my role. That was the place that they wanted me to call. And that's what I did. And, and uh, I, it was, it was kind of fun for a while because it was different for me after all these years, it was, it was fun, but it wasn't something I wanted to do long-term. That's for sure. Did you ever seriously consider being a manager? I mean, at this point you've done everything in wrestling. Could you have ever seen yourself in front of the camera in a managerial role, much like your pal, Jim Cornette, or some of your other favorites over the years? Well, first of all, let's get this straight. I wasn't nearly as talented as a, to be a manager as Jim Cornette, or Paul Heyman, a lot of those guys, they were just born into that role. And, uh, I wasn't. So I knew what my strengths lie and that strengths were li- lied in telling stories and getting talent over. So, uh, I, I just, I never, I never took it real seriously that I was ever going to be a manager. I facilitated some TV stories with some entering promos and some things of that nature. Uh, but other than that, uh, I had no desire to become the next Cornette or, or Bobby Heenan because God almighty, I didn't have the talent. That wasn't my role. That wasn't my specialty. So, uh, you know, I, I did what I could and I, I played my part. I ran the plays the coach said to run to the best of my ability, but it was, uh, it wasn't something I set out to do or one of my life goals was to become a pro wrestling manager, not in the least. On Monday afternoon, McMahon would send, uh, send a post online in continuation of this angle saying that Ross would be forced to apologize for his statements doing the swerve that they were going to be dropping the angle. Since most people at this point knew Hall and Nash weren't coming back. However, on the actual television show, Monday night, raw Ross said he apologized because his comments upset delicate negotiations with Ramon, but he was standing by his story and that the negotiations with diesel were still going strong. He continued to promise before every commercial break to have more on this story by the end of the show as a way to keep viewers and hit the angle hard again at the end of the show. Do you remember having conversations with people in the company? Like I'm sure some of the boys and some of the other luminaries backstage were like, Hey, are Holland Nash really coming back? Or are you trying to play all this close to the vest or what do you recall of that? Close to the vest, Conrad, close to the vest. It's. It was Vince's idea. We were running with Vince's creative simple as that. You know, I didn't come up with the language or the verbiage or whatever for that uh, presentation. That was all Vince and he, he knew what he wanted. He explained it to me. Uh, I was cool with it. Uh, was it something I would have probably done as if I were the booker, probably not, but that's irrelevant. That wasn't, that wasn't an issue. So, uh, no, I'm. It was just another, it's another storyline. That's all it was. It's another storyline. So Monday night raw would be recapped in the observer. The WWF continued its razor Ramon diesel angle. The first part of which will climax on September 23rd, live on raw from Hershey PA. It's a definite that Rick Bogner and Glenn Jacobs will be razor and diesel respectively on the live show as heels as Bogner canceled his war tour to start the new role with the WWF. And this week's twist was that gorilla monsoon announced that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash are under contract to another organization. 
and that while he liked Jim Ross, he said he felt like someone was hoodwinking the WWF fans. So the deal now is that it was all Jim Ross and not the WWF. So the WWF is trying to separate itself from the heat. So as people are considering this angle, a pathetic ratings getting fraud. It appears well, it pretty much was, wasn't it? It was. That's exactly yeah, what, what it was. What the hell? It probably it pretty much was. This is a, it was a sensationalistic attempt to get ratings. And if they got ratings, then it's been a winner. And good old JR's name would not been brought through it. And if it didn't uh, result in the re- the results that it was expected to, uh, then you got a goat. You got somebody you can blame it on, and that'd be me. And I'm sure some of the, them trying to back up and separate a little bit and make an announcement like that, that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash are signed to another organization is because as a reminder, we're knee deep in a lawsuit where the world wrestling federation is suing Ted Turner's world championship wrestling because they're saying they're, they're taking their IP with the way these characters were presented. So I guess there's fear maybe that WCW could counter sue, or it could invalidate the original lawsuit. If you went too far to create confusion in the marketplace that perhaps the real life Scott Hall and Kevin Nash are coming back, but along the way, they sort of position you here as a heel, right? I mean, you look like the heel yeah, in this yeah. deal. Yeah. Kind of, I yeah. guess so something to try, you know, it didn't bother me. I was happy to try it and, uh, more important. That's what the boss wanted. You know, we ain't got to re- re- over overthink this deal. Conrad it's Vince booked it. He liked it. He wanted to do it. And so my job, along with anybody else in this whole equation was to try to pull it off and make it work. Well, we know for sure that, uh, something else you've, uh, had no problem trying and you've been able to pull off and make work is blue chew. It's yeah, the real baby. deal. Boys and girls, Jim and I both love this product. We both believe in it. We know you will too. It's going to deliver to you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime. You can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Think of it as a really easy process because it is. Number one, sign up at bluechew.com. Number two, you consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And number three, once you're approved, you get your prescription in just a few days. It's shipped to your door in a discreet package. By the way, all their products are made right here in the USA, but maybe the best part of this whole deal is the entire process can be done online virtually. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. You just handle your business online. It shows up at your front door and now we're ready to let the good times roll. That's right. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And man, we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try blue chew free. When you use our promo code, JR at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code JR will help you receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank blue chew for sponsoring today's podcast. One of our longest tenured sponsors. Yes. And uh, the reason that you see blue chew here, there, and yon advertising is because it's very simple, folks. It works. Uh, I had Blue Chew experience not that long ago. And I can tell you from experience, they deliver every single time. So give it a shot. And there's no better time right now to try it. First month free, pay $5 shipping. That's it. Why not? Give it a shot. See how you like it. I promise you're going to like it. Bluechew.com and use our promo code JR. So let's talk about, uh, coming off mind games, the in your house pay-per-view event on September 22nd, you're going to wind up being positioned here as the scapegoat for this razor diesel angle. Oh, poor JR scapegoat. <laughs> so we've got Rick Bogner dressed up as razor Ramon, Glenn Jacobs dressed up as diesel, and they're going to attack Savio Vega. And the entire episode of Monday night raw was built around teasing their appearance later in the show. And. Of course, WCW had already made it plain and clear on nitro this same night by having Scott Hall and Kevin Nash on camera very early in the show. So yeah, there you go. Uh, WCW, I guess tries to have their own inside joke on their show. They introduced Mike Jones, the former Virgil. Of course, if you're keeping up with your longtime wrestling history, 
when they created a manservant role for the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, which is someone that Vince sort of saw himself as if Vince himself was going to be a wrestler, it's been said that the million dollar man character in the eighties would have been the character he would have donned. I see that. And his manservant was named Virgil. Of course, the real life name of dusty Rhodes, who was booking the competitions, Jim Crockett promotions and the NWA on the other channel. So now that we have the former Virgil, the real life, Mike Jones on WCW, what are we going to name him? Vincent. These guys are having fun with some of this tongue and cheek stuff here. Are they not? Oh yeah. It's kind of taking it too far. I, I mean, I, well, I'm not defending Vince, but bottom line is, is that it's an awful lot of thought given to something, you know, Virgil's never going to sell any tickets, right? Mike Jones, not going to sell any tickets, No, but they were having fun and going along with the, the rib. And, uh, so that's what that was. It just, it was a waste of time. They bottom line, and that may be harsh, but I thought it was a, a waste of time. What well, wasn't a waste of time is your performance here. The night after mind games, Monday night, raw, we see you in the center of the ring by yourself and Meltzer called it a tremendous one man performance. And you're almost going to turn heel a little bit here and explain what's going on and why you're doing it. And this is the first time in all your years in wrestling, you've been asked to do something like this, right? Jim? Yeah, I just want, it was fun for me because I wanted to be able to prove that I could pull off, pull it off. Yes. You know, you're not a one trick pony. You're not out there just looking for a headlock to call or some fancy name on a hold, uh, you know, uh, so yeah, I, 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 but I enjoyed the opportunity to expand my role and my skill set. That's a rough picture right there. I don't know what that was between Bill's palsy. I don't know which, what about that was probably the first or second one. Uh, but that. I was always a little bit, uh, uh, a little self-conscious about that. Well, you worked your ass off in this promo. I want to encourage everybody to go out of their way to check it out. It's a quote unquote worked shoot angle. According to Dave Meltzer, Ross turned on the WWF saying he left a good job in Atlanta and was also an announcer for the Atlanta Falcons when he was brought in to be the lead play by play man in the WWF. He said his first appearance was at WrestleMania nine where they had him dress in a toga. And he said he left broadcasting the NFL to wear a toga. He said, if you check my call of the King of the ring that year, it was a level above what anyone else in wrestling is capable of. And that everyone in this audience knows he's the best play by play announcer in the business. And that actually got a big baby face pop. So you're in the middle of this diatribe sort of explaining <laughs> why you're doing what you're doing. And the fans are with it. Did anybody help script this? Or are you scripting this yourself? No, there was no script writer on that stuff. I just made, made, you know, I, I got, I got direction on what was, uh, what was desired, but nothing written down. No, it's just instincts. And, uh, it was all new for me. So it was exciting and exciting and new come aboard. We're expecting you love boat horrible. Sorry. I apologize to the world right now. Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, again, new territory and somebody that had been in the business as long as I had was certainly, uh, you know, they certainly, uh, were willing to try things. If you don't, you go crazy. Don't take me out of my comfort zone because I might not be as good at this other role as I was in the former role. So, uh, you know, it's crazy. It is an incredible promo. I mean, it, it goes, I don't know, five minutes or so, but so, so good. You talk about being taken off television because the egotistical owner of the WWF Vince McMahon couldn't stand the competition and you're getting some cheers and some booze here too. And then you talk about getting Bell's palsy and being fired two weeks later. And that you would have to tell your new wife and two little girls that their daddy had been fired. And you're talking about how you had to live in Connecticut, which you called an overpriced hellhole. And you said when uh, Vince got indicted that they brought you back and then let you go again. He was finally no, brought true. The thing about that is it's all true. Yes. It's not storyline. 
So sometimes what happens in real life is more viable and more entertaining, uh, than, than not. So, uh, we just took the truth, massaged it a little bit, and then rolled it out there and see, and to see how it was going to get over. You talk about being brought back for 50 cents on the dollar. And eventually you introduce razor Ramon and we've got the classic razor Ramon entrance music. That's going to get a big pop here. And then of course, immediately they recognize, wait, that ain't the same guy. And the crowd just sort of deflates. Yeah. And then almost immediately Savio Vega attacks him and the show goes off the air without ever actually introducing diesel. I guess they're trying to hold one back for next week as Dave sort of guess here in the observer. What'd you think when this was all said and done, it's your debut of an, an in-ring promo like this, doing some real character work. Were you pleased with it? Was Vince pleased with it? I think he was. I think he was. I certainly, uh, I didn't know what to expect, but I think we pulled it off. I think we pulled it off. Uh, it was going to be a big, long term, uh, uh, situation. Never thought it was, but I thought we could get some, a little bit of mileage out of it. And I, I believe that we did, you know, we got some mileage, but is it, it pretty much ran its course on to on schedule. We, uh, we ought to also mention that the next week, uh, they're going to record an argument between yourself and gorilla monsoon. Vega does wind up having a singles match with razor Ramon diesel's going to interfere. The fans aren't booing. Like maybe the promotion was expecting, but there are some people who are deflated and they even say a lot of people are walking out of the building. Uh, and it just came off really bad live. Do you remember this sort of dying a slow death? on camera or no? Yeah, I can feel it. You can feel it, Conrad. Uh, but you know, again, it's, I'm not booking this, right? I have a role to play. It's real simple. And the role that I was playing, uh, was this disgruntled guy, uh, who had all these legitimate reasons for being pissed off and angry. Uh, but no, I, yeah, you can feel it any angle. You can feel it peaking. Or it could be stone cold rock anybody. So, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't have an issue with it. Uh, I knew it was going to Peter out. No pun intended for blue chew. I love Peter now. Uh, you wrote in your book, I was just happy that Jacob's got another chance at a storyline. The new diesel character wasn't going to stick, but I had a feeling the WWF would have something else for him when the time came. I knew I'd keep him around if it was my call and soon it was my call. I guess that's worth mentioning that this is the era where JJ Dillon is going to be transitioning out and you're going to be moving up, uh, to really assume, uh, that, that talent relations role. Um, Kane would say this about the fake diesel character. Ironically, I think Gerald Briscoe told me while we were in South Africa or Kuwait, I can't remember which one, but he told me that Vince wanted to talk to me. When I got home, I came home from overseas and Vince explained to me what they want to do. And that I'm going to become the fake diesel character. The concept of the storyline was excellent. What had happened was that Jr. was going to turn heel and he was going to reveal that he was the creative mastermind behind WWE success. So it was going to be me and the fake razor Ramon. The problem is that Jr. is not likened to a heel character because people really like him. So that doesn't work very well. And when we're looking at storylines, yes, the concept is great, but it just doesn't work in reality because a lot of what we do is based on the audience to accept that. And they didn't accept this whole thing. No matter what, it was the fake diesel and the fake razor Ramon. At least I wasn't a dentist anymore. Boy, what a great line. At least I wasn't a dentist anymore. That's right. You got a chance to start over. Erase the, 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 the uh, dry board and start writing stuff down. That's different. Uh, but all along, nobody ever doubted the fact that Glenn is going to be successful. It was just a matter of when and how it's going to happen. Let's also mention that, uh, he does have a little bit of success and it is going to get him some more TV time. I mean, I know nobody loved Isaac Ankum and nobody really loved the fake diesel character, but we do have some glimmers of hope. Here. I mean, he's going to get the team with Rick Bogner as the fake razor Ramon and work against real talented teams like Owen Hart and Davey boy Smith. 
it's not necessarily enough to, uh, that was a pay-per-view match by the way, but I, I know long-term nobody had any confidence in this, but as you've often said, you got to keep your Jersey, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And keep, keep plugging away. Keep, keep maximizing those minutes. And I think Glenn always did that. He was smart enough to know that these great opportunities, uh, didn't grow on trees and he's going to take advantage and, uh, he's going to pack up his apples and move on. And I, I, uh, I just said a lot of guys would not have put the time and the emotion into their new gimmick like Glenn did. Uh, and that's why he succeeded. He never quit. Well, these gimmicks only last about four months. I think the 97 Royal rumble is maybe their last big swan song on TV. Uh, but it comes down to where the fake diesel, man, he's one of the last few folks in the ring there at the Royal rumble. But once it's all said and done, where we're done with diesel and razor, he goes back to Memphis for a few more months. He's still using the fake diesel character. And they even have him reprise his early Memphis doomsday gimmick. Meanwhile, on TV, Paul Bearer starts teasing that he's got a deep, dark secret about the undertaker's past. So remember now fake diesel's finishing up, we'll call it late January. And then post WrestleMania, we start to hear from Paul Bearer that he's got this deep, dark secret about the undertaker. Right. And this might actually be one of the best builds for a character's debut in WWF history. And what an intricate backstory that Bruce Pritchard really took a lot of pride in. what do you think of the, the backstory and the debut of Kane? I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought uh, Bruce and everybody involved in the creative, uh, did an outstanding job because it, at the end of the day, the, how I determined that if they did an outstanding job or not was, did we get results? And I think nobody can argue the fact that, that Glenn successfully, uh, you know, successfully pulled that off. And I thought that he did. Let's, uh, let's talk about how we get there. Uh, it's a six month build. I suppose it starts in April of 97 and in your house, 14 revenge of the taker, the undertaker launches a fireball into the face of Paul bear who had previously had mankind do the same to the undertaker a few weeks prior. Well, on the May 12th edition of Monday night raw mankind introduces bear who is attempting to reunite with taker because of his newfound status as the champion. And as a reminder, bear was now a bad guy. He had turned on taker the prior SummerSlam, And we've seen a lot of online video of Jim Cornette and Tom Pritchard being heavily involved in Kane's training, like the way they wanted him to act and work and just basically be like the undertaker, the way they sit up and turn the head and the whole thing. Who else was responsible? Do you think for putting a lot of groundwork into the development of what this Kane persona would be? Who did you mention Jim Cornette and Tom Pritchard? Yeah. Well, they were big time involved. Yep. Uh, no doubt. I'm trying to thank, uh, Bruce. Of course. Yeah. The obvious Bruce had a big love affair with the undertaker and the character and the development thereof. So Bruce was been, should get a lot of credit for the success of that. The June 30th raw is where we get the big reveal. Paul bear is going to reveal that the undertaker's long lost brother Kane was coming to the WWF to challenge him. And of course, in sharing this news, Paul bear discloses that the undertaker had started a fire at his family's funeral home in effect, murdering his whole family and bear starts yelling. He's alive. Kane is alive. This is some of Paul's best character work he ever did. And we should mention. And a lot of people have put this together over the years, way back when at survivor series, 1990, when the undertaker first debuts in the world wrestling federation, he was billed as Kane, the undertaker, and it only lasted a few weeks. And then he was just the undertaker, but here Kane is the undertaker is thinking he's been long dead from this accidental fire that he set burning down the funeral home. And I guess his brother. He's been told has been left physically and mentally scarred. And the undertaker is going to claim that Kane was the pyromaniac. He was the one who started the fire. what do you think of this, this backstory that 
I need I needed to get into it a little bit. Yes. I need to experience it a little bit. I wasn't turned off by it, but I wasn't sure how successful it was going to be and how successful it was going to be, uh, was record setting. It's going to be really impressive what they're able to put together here. And Glenn would say this, the whole Kane thing came about when Vader got arrested in Kuwait. They had that deal where Leon roughed up the talk show host and literally got arrested in Kuwaiti jail. And they needed someone to work with the undertaker. The thought was, okay, we'll hot shot this deal. We needed an angle. Well, Glenn can do it. He basically matches up physically with taker. What's the storyline. I don't know if it was Bruce or Vince that initially came up with the thought of, well, he could come back under a mask as the brother who got burned in the fire. Well, Vince liked it so much. He says, why are we going to waste this on a one-time match when we can actually turn this into a long-term angle? I'm down in Memphis when all this stuff is happening and I get a call, I think from Cornette, or it might've been Bruce. I don't remember exactly who, and they run the thing by me. Hey, you're going to be working with Mark. And this is the guy who really got him noticed originally. So the idea that he gets to come in and work a long time program with the undertaker, I mean, this has to just be, this is the news. Everybody would be hoping for no? Hell yeah. Why wouldn't it be? How could you ask for anything better? If you're Glenn Jacobs, yeah, you're going to get a chance to dance with the big guy. And now it's up to you to deliver and, and Kane always delivered and he delivered enough that he made undertaker happy. And so undertaker kept looking for more ways to work with Glenn. And, uh, that was nothing but good news for Glenn and the fans, because it was a new story. It was a, it, it got the undertaker involved in a new character. It was just great stuff. Good timing. Uh, it was just really good stuff. What's interesting to me too, is because we've talked about this before, you know, uh, and Bruce really has hammered it on his podcast, something to wrestle that if the guy really believes in the character, he can make it work, but when he half asses it, it almost never works, but a guy who's really committed to it, he can make it work. And, and I think the great example in that is the undertaker. When you really think about, okay, he's got these supernatural powers and he's dead, but he's not dead. And he can summon thunder and lightning and he can just float in the air. And okay. Some of this stuff is a little silly. Like what are we doing? But on the other hand, you ask yourself, Hey, if anybody else had been tasked with doing the undertaker character, would it have lasted two years, two months, two weeks? I mean, certainly not more than two decades. The undertaker no. was committed to that character. Therefore it was successful. And one of the most iconic characters in wrestling history. And you could suspend your disbelief on some of the silliness because he was so good and so committed. Well, I want to ask you sort of the same thing. Could you, even if you tried, imagine anybody else portraying Kane? Cause I can't No, no way in hell, yeah. no way in hell. Kane was, you know, it's, uh, that's great casting. It's great booking. In other words. Yes. Uh, and he, and, and Glenn always, he, like I said earlier, he delivered every Mickey mouse bullshit character that he was put in. He made work to some degree, to some degree. So, uh, uh, but he was, uh, the Glenn Jacobs was the perfect choice to be involved with the undertaker in a variety of ways. And, and, and one of the reasons that worked was because taker had such respect and, uh, he was, he, he, he believed that Glenn was the guy. And so when that happens, uh, your, your chances of being successful are greatly, uh, enhanced. Like Bruce said, if a, if a TV, if a, if a man or a woman truly believes in their TV persona, they can make things work. Things that we didn't see, uh, things that we didn't think were going to happen. So, uh, I, I just, you got to give credit to, to Glenn for making it happen, but you also got to give maybe even more credit to Taker, uh, because Taker made sure it happened. Uh, and he had that much st uh, stroke and clout credibility, et cetera, uh, to take it all the way of what he did. We see the big debut for Kane happen at an incredible pay-per-view in St. Louis. Unfortunately, it's the night after we lost Brian Pillman in your house, bad blood. 
is a legendary show. First of all, because of the incredible cage match, the very first ever hell in a cell with the undertaker and Shawn Michaels. I know it's not the most famous hell in a cell because Mick Foley didn't come flying off the top rope, but if you're going to watch one match from what we've been discussing today, make it this one, the main event of in your house, bad blood, October, 1997. What an incredible main event, but what do you know? Kane makes his debut. He comes down, rips the freaking door off the cage. And what a great memorable call from Vince McMahon here. That's gotta be, that's gotta be Kane. <laughs> Kane's wearing a red mask to hide the supposed scars on his face from the fire. As a kid, most of his body is covered as well to conceal those scars. But when Kane rips the door off its hinges and goes face to face with the undertaker, he does what would become his trademark, setting the ring posts on fire and then hits the tombstone on the undertaker that costs him the match. I think you could argue this is one of the best introductions or debuts, if not the best introduction or debut in the history of not only the WWF, but professional wrestling. Like wow. we had heard about him. We hadn't seen him. But here he is, and he's not just in here somewhere in the show. It's the main event, the first hell in a cell between the undertaker and Shawn Michaels. And he's the deciding factor. Talk about making a statement. This has got to be just one of the biggest moments, if not the biggest moment in his whole career. No, that's the way you introduce somebody, Conrad, you yes. make, they make an impact and without a lot of, without a lot of gray area. Uh, I, I was. I didn't know what to expect from that match because we had never had one. Uh, but man, I was awestruck. Sean and Taker had a, the match of matches. It's one that if you haven't seen it, you're be well served to go back and watch it. Yes. And I mean that it's not just hyperbole. It was like, it, I was so pleasantly surprised about how well that thing worked. It was, it's worth going back and watching again. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a great match and then you add Kane's in, involvement god it just made it perfect it just made it perfect a great one of the all-time great introductions and presentations on any wwe pay-per-view an incredible moment an incredible match and the undertaker is now sent into hiding for roughly the next two months and Kane is just going to go on a huge war path here is going to show up randomly on like every episode of Monday night raw and cause destruction everywhere he goes, whether it's with the headbangers or Ahmed Johnson or the Hardy boys, Kane leaves them all laying and Paul bear is promising continued destruction until the undertaker agrees to fight his brother. This is how you book somebody. Kane looks absolutely unstoppable and boy, we are a long way from a wrestling dentist at this point. You're damn right. And it, we, we finally found the persona yes. that worked and just, you got to keep looking and not give up on the talent and nobody was going to give up on Glenn Jacobs. That's for sure. Uh, and I think a lot of us are just excited for him because he was such a good guy and he deserved the opportunity to be a success. And then of course you, then you turn it over to the talent and how, how big a success can you be? Uh, and, and how big a success do you want to be? Well, Glenn answered all those questions, uh, very quickly. No doubt he did. Um, and what's interesting is we're just showing him laying waste the dudes. We're not actually showing a lot of matches of his on TV. In fact, I think his, his first televised match, uh, is where he's going to wrestle. I guess I should back that up. Dude love puts up the biggest fight against Kane, but ultimately he channels the darker side of his character. Mankind to challenge Kane at a Survivor Series match in Montreal. And that's going to be Kane's first televised official match. Otherwise, he had just been beating dudes up. Uh, now, of course, he had been working house shows along the way and things like that, as you might imagine. But um, holding back on, make, on letting a guy make his, you know, television wrestling debut, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome because it shows some real patience. Can you speak to that? The patience of how, you know, we're, we're having him destroy people on TV, but we're not giving an official match, if you will. 
Well, it was, it was just a booking theory. Yeah. It's philosophy of booking. Uh, I liked it. I liked it. I, I thought it worked out real well. And, and, uh, it was a matter of not force feeding Kane to the audience. And we didn't, it was very, very strategic booking in my, my view. So, uh, and I thought it was done correctly. I would be honest with you. It was just, I couldn't have booked it in hindsight any better than they, they it was booked. It was easy to get into. It was an easy story to tell. Uh, it was just, it was right on point, right on point. And it, and then one reason for that was the fact that undertaker had such ownership of that angle, of that storyline. So a lot of takers fingerprints, shall we say, were all over that storyline. He, he had a invested interest in it. He knew where it was going. He knew what he needed to do to make it happen. And he did, he did everything he needed to do. Undertaker was very, very, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for, uh, he was just, he was, a, he, he had the ability to share Yeah, and, and all that, he, where a lot of top talents would not give that much of themselves because they were insecure. Taker was not insecure. And he knew that, 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 uh, Glenn was a, a, the keeper of this deal. He, Glenn's going to make this thing all work because he's It's all going to come together, uh, in this wonderful story and which, and what you did. Yeah. It really is incredible, especially when you consider that working as this Kane character, he only had two regular quote unquote matches before this pay-per-view debut. He's going to wrestle Vader, uh, once in Rochester, once in Binghamton, New Jersey, and then he's ready for the pay-per-view and almost immediately after the pay-per-view, he gets to make his Madison square garden debut. And then right behind that, his Greensboro Coliseum debut as this character, of course, those are you know, the home of WrestleMania and the home of Starcade and him being such a student of the game, those had to be big opportunities, but it doesn't get much bigger than a featured match on a big pay-per-view. And unfortunately, nobody talks about the 1997 survivor series for the Kane match. We all talk about the famed, or I guess infamous Montreal screw job. But what was interesting is to go back and watch this match. And I would encourage people, if you're wanting to go down the Kane rabbit hole, Fire up your peacock, watch survivor series 97, where he wrestles mankind. So we've got two monsters against each other, but we try something a little different. They're going to wrestle the match in this dark red lighting, shining over the ring. And you were at least trying something here that I thought was pretty cool. what do you think of the effect of we're going to have him wrestle and you'll be able to see, but it won't look like all the other matches. It'll be with this dark red tent. Well, it's going to be different. And you know, how, how well would, would it be received? I don't, I didn't know it was different. It was new, always willing to try something different and new. No doubt about that. I think I've said here a zillion times wrestling fans like new, and this was new. And if anybody could pull it off, uh, it was Mick, Mick and Glenn were buddies and, and, uh, Mick was a team guy without a question. So, uh, uh I, I, I was willing to give it a shot. You know, Hey, we've been right, right on the money thus far. What's what reason would we have to think that it wasn't going to work? Well, here's what I know is going to work every time. Of course, we're talking about a G one. You're going to be ready for everything that your day brings you with just one delicious scoop of a G one and a cup of water. That's it. My wife starts every single day with this on her way to the gym. And she tells me she feels more productive there. I know on the off chance I miss a day, I feel that afternoon crash, but with AG one on my side, man, I'm able to stay focused and have that clarity to really keep me on top of my game at a business level late in the day. AG one, man, it's just perfect for everything that ails you. I mean that if you want better gut health, if you want a boost in energy, if you want to provide some immune system support. Hey, maybe you just hate taking pills and vitamins, or you want a supplement that actually tastes great. Well, AG one is a foundational nutritional supplement that delivers to you comprehensive nutrients for whole body health. I mean it you can replace your multivitamin, your probiotic and more all in one simple drinkable habit. Think of it as like a micro habit with macro results because it is a science driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients. They've really helped raise the standard and it's because they've got everything that you need to support energy and focus and strength and clarity 
with their 75 different high quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients. I think you're going to love AG1. I want you to try it. And if you're looking for a simpler and effective investment for your health, why not try AG1? And we'll get you five free AG1 travel packs and even a free one year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. All you got to do is go to drinkag1.com slash JR. That's drinkag1.com slash JR. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Amen, Connie. Amen. You know, their, their, their national advertising campaign is absolutely amazing. They meaning pronoun boy, uh, they meaning AG1, uh, they're everywhere and uh, they're selling a lot of product. And again, you go back to the old equation, the old salesman thing. Why are they selling a lot of product? Because it works and certainly AG1 works. So uh, give it a shot. Great offer there. And, uh, you'll be glad that you did. No doubt. Super great product. We both love it. Think you will too. Of course, uh, back on the uh, cane topic in storyline taker is refusing to face cane and he's doing so adamantly while Kane is humiliating him. And the undertaker claimed that he promised his parents, he would never do harm to his old flesh and blood. And after what was thought to be a brief partnership on the go home show for Royal rumble, 1998 Kane winds up betraying the undertaker, costing him the WWF title after interfering in the title casket match against Shawn Michaels at the Royal rumble pay-per-view. And after the match, as if that's not enough that he's cost him the match, he's going to lock his brother, the undertaker in a casket and set it on fire. Now, Bruce has told this story before that when you do stunts like this, you have to, uh, sometimes take a walk with a fire marshal to have a conversation because you're not supposed to be doing this. No. Um, but what a visual, what a special effect. I mean, you want to talk about getting a character over. I've never seen anything like this in wrestling. This is unbelievable. The visual. And, and, and a lot of that is takers doing. Oh yeah. Taker taker was the guy that had the original ideas as best I understand. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was striking. It was so memorable. No doubt about it. And another hit, another booking hit for taker. If there's nothing else. Cause you can bet your ass he's going to be deeply involved in the creative of getting buried a lot or getting burned alive. It's uh quite a visual and it sets up Kane's second match at the pay-per-view. It's going to be February, 1998, no way out. Kane is going to be here with Vader and he's actually going to hit Vader in the face with a wrench. He gets the win here after a couple more months of absence, the undertaker is resurrected, I guess. On March 2nd, on a Monday night raw, where he is going to, uh, come up from a coffin that's been struck by a lightning bolt and furiously challenging Kane in the process. You guys, if nothing else are really upping your special effects budget here for this storyline. No. Yeah, no doubt about it, but it fit the undertaker's character. Yes, it did. It perfect. It fit his character. Perfectly. He's supposed to do the, the unknown and the unpredictable and all those type things. So. Uh, I, it just kept fitting the creative just kept fitting. And it was a credit to the guys involved in doing it. And I mentioned Taker so many times here, but when you got a star like he, him, you, you, he's got to cooperate. He's got to be involved and invested. And he was, and that's what made this thing successful. Well, one of the things you guys see is Kane setting up a crew member on fire. So one of the members of the uh, camera crew gets set on fire. He even sends some lightning bolts down to the monitors at the announce table. He's trying to show that, you know, he's got these same sort of powers that the undertaker does. And finally, after nine months, since Paul bear first mentioned the word Kane, they finally meet Kane and the undertaker WrestleMania 14. What a big moment it is. They're in Boston. We're proving once again here that long-term storytelling pays off. And before yep. the match, of course, Kane very famously and memorably tombstones, Pete Rose, much to the delight of the Boston fans. It takes <laughs> not one, not two, but three tombstones for the undertaker to beat his brother Kane. And after the match, Kane and Paul bear continue to attack the undertaker, hitting him with a steel chair, even giving him a tombstone on the chair. Um, 
this, the pile driver spot. I mean, obviously it's a big moment. Kane and the undertaker for the first time at WrestleMania that just feels just. And so in the way things ought to be, but the thing that people talk about all these years later is the dog on tombstone on Pete Rose. Who would have thought yeah. at the time that would become such a big piece of history? No. Yeah, but it was, and it yeah. is, people still talk about it. Uh, I get asked that question a lot on Q and A's and things. So, uh, it works out pretty, it worked out pretty well. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we'll get the information on the screen, but, uh, I got, uh, uh I need to remind everybody I'm, I'm still doing some appearances and uh, this may be out of place for it, but no. uh, we'll get, we'll get some information up there on how you meet, how you get in touch with my guy, uh, S- Stephen Wolf on uh, booking my, me for some appearances. If you're interested. And we'll, we'll get the bull, get an address up there for you sooner than later. Yeah. We'll throw it up on the screen and we'll make sure that we uh, post it through social as well. We want to make sure that you see Jr. when he's in your neck of the woods and you can ask him, Jim, do you think the Kane undertaker match could have ever lived up to the hype? That is one of the drawbacks of say like a nine month build is especially when it's two behemoths, two big dudes. I think people have this expectation that. Oh, what if this monster fought that monster sort of almost like, you know, one of those Godzilla movies, right? Like this monster versus another, but I don't know, or Jason versus Freddy or any of those classic Halloween movies too, I suppose. But I don't know that this could, could anything live up to a nine month build is what I'm getting to. Does it set an unrealistic expectation? Yeah. Yeah, it does, but it worked. Yeah. It all fit. And you very rarely have something that fits as well as this undertaker story with, with Kane very rarely. And it just worked out beautifully. It, I mean, these, this story is such a great story and we know it's going to continue on for what feels like decades, uh, multiple decades. Um, but what an iconic debut at a WrestleMania for Kane. I mean, think back. It wasn't that long ago. He was the fake diesel. And before that the wrestling dentist. And before that he was dressed up like a freaking Christmas tree. And now here he is against the undertaker at WrestleMania and tombstoning Pete Rose in Boston. That's big, big stuff. And the creative gets a little wacky from here after WrestleMania, we see Kane digging up the graves of their parents, setting fire to his own father's casket, choke slamming the undertaker into his mother's casket. And that sets up, I can't believe this is real. The first ever inferno match in the history of the WWF where the ring is surrounded by flames. And in order to win the match, you have to set your opponent on fire. And it's an amazing spectacle, but probably not the best idea. The real life Kane has a great story about how he was supposed to get to the venue the night before to just see how all this works and do a walkthrough and a run through of sorts. And the limousine went the wrong way. So by the time they actually got there, they had missed it. There was no chance to do it. So he walks into the building the day of the pay-per-view knowing I'm going to be set on fire and I have no training or special skills as to how to do this. Yeah. Uh, Where else in pro wrestling could that happen? Never. It, It could never happen in a million years. If this was a movie stunt, they would have spent nine months on this. We spent about nine hours on this. It's the brainchild of Vince Russo. And now we're going to. Make it happen. As I understand, Gerald Briscoe was running the apparatus on the outside. So whenever there was a bump, the flares, the the flames would come up, but that those flames become unbearable to two guys who are fully clothed head to toe. One of whom is wearing a mask. And I know they've both drenched themselves in water before they go out, but it's hard to catch your breath with all that heat that the fire is taking up so much of that oxygen. Yeah, I said, how about setting at ringside, Conrad, and doing commentary? Oh, gosh, I didn't think of that. It's uncomfortable, disconcerting, uh, and it was dangerous. So, uh, you know, we were surrounded by flames, and there's no way for it not to be extremely hot and dangerous and uncomfortable. So for what those those guys went through and Gerald Briscoe's uh, assistance uh, can't be spoken of enough. Really an incredible visual. Uh, I mean, it almost seems 
like something that shouldn't have happened, but it did. And I guess Kane sleep slips on some sort of, uh, sleeve protection. His arm gets caught on fire. He, uh, he, uh, retreats to the back. So Kane, after his big debut, he's lost not one, but two matches to the undertaker. I still think he'd take it over being a wrestling dentist any day. Uh, and the storyline gets on yet another twist. It turns out that Paul bear might actually be Kane's father. And this is the night after Vader is going to lose a mask versus mask match at the over the edge pay-per-view. And then we would see Kane defeat the undertaker to become the number one contender for the WWF championship, which is owned and operated by Steve Austin at the time. In hindsight, what do you think of that whole twist that Paul bear is actually Kane's dad? I kind of liked it. Actually, it's a new element. Yep. It fit, it tied together. Uh, you can, you could easily connect the dots. So, uh, I, I didn't have any problem with it at all. I thought it added to the story and all those great stories have to have, have new things added, uh, as it progress. And I thought uh, the timing of, of adding something new was spot on. And let's mention too, you know, this is an era of a lot of firsts, the first Inferno match. And now here in June at the King of the ring pay-per-view in 1998 in Pittsburgh, we're going to have our first ever WWE first blood match. And that's going to be with Kane who wears a mask that is red, by the way, against stone cold, Steve Austin. Of course, almost no one talks about Kane and his title win here. That's right. He beat stone cold for the world title, but nobody even talks about it because what do you know? There's another hell in the cell that night and the undertaker throws mankind off the top. Good God is my witness. He's been broken in half. What an iconic moment in wrestling history. It overshadows the main event, the white hot stone cold, Steve Austin dropping the title to Kane. I mean, here, this guy is just a few years removed from being the wrestling dentist. And now he's just beaten the hottest box office attraction in the history of wrestling to become the WWF champion. What a moment, what a run. I mean, think about that. The guy debuted as this character in October and by June, he's the top dog wild. Pretty cool, huh? It's an incredible story. That's the, the value that you mentioned earlier of, uh, you know, persistence. Yeah. And, and staring, steering the course, uh, was important. Mm -hmm. So we, we did that. We steered the course and, and, uh, it, it was, it just worked out beautifully. This is one of the most beautifully crafted storylines that I can ever remember being a part of. And it was just, it had all the elements, the stars, the cooperation, uh, the guys that were wanting to go the extra mile, i.e. Taker and Kane and Paul bear, God bless them all. So, uh, it was, a, it was just a beautiful story. Absolutely. I wish all wrestling could be this simple and this straightforward. We got to talk about, uh, the next night on Monday night raw, we would see Austin win the title back in Cleveland after Kane accepts Austin's challenge to a rematch. This is one of the biggest matches ever seen on cable TV for professional wrestling. It's also got some of the biggest pops I can ever remember hearing during the Monday night wars. Austin is the new champ again. Uh, so it's a one day reign, but Hey, it counts. It's in the record books, just a handful of months in. He was working with the undertaker at WrestleMania, the first ever Inferno match. And by God, he beat stone cold on pay-per-view for the world title. Uh, we're going to stop it down for there. There's no way we can cover decades of conversation about Kane in just a couple of hours. So we're going to pick up our conversation about Kane at some point in the future. But for now, let's do a few questions. We got tons of questions. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to everybody who hung out with us as part of our live studio audience today. Uh, Eric green was here and Bobby was here and coach Rosie was here. And we just appreciate all you guys showing up so early on a weekday morning like this to hang out with us. Uh, Instagram, a wrestling historian says, do you think Kane would have been world champion on more occasions or was he better off as a special attraction? Now, this is an interesting question here, Jim, because a lot of times guys like Bruce would say, Jake didn't need the belt. He was an attraction. Andre didn't need the belt. He was an attraction million dollar man. Didn't need the belt. He was an attraction. That sort of thing. 
Right. Do you think Kane needed more title runs or did he too fall under that attraction? I think he fell under the attraction, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. Uh, just to me, it was no brainer. He didn't need it to be, uh, noteworthy, uh, to be recognized and all those things. He just didn't need it. Uh, but he was a star. He had become a star, uh, and, uh, and, and without any doubt. So anyway, he, he did well. It just shows you, you don't have to have a title to get over. If that's what you need, then you, then you never were going to probably be over to any degree. So, uh, uh, but I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of the personas on that we see on TV getting over, not, they're not getting over because they carried a belt to the ring. Right. Uh, and, and Kane just didn't need that prop. He was a prop, a human, a human prop. He was a seven foot, 300 pound prop. If you want to say it that way and all due respect. Uh, so, but he didn't need a title to be a star. Uh, we, the, the creative Bruce and all those guys had done a great job of, of, of getting Kane over. And I think that Lawler and I did a good job of representing who we wanted the people to perceive Kane was and, uh, Cause his matches are easy to call. Uh, it just, it just were. So, uh, I, I'm, a, I I keep, I look back at the creative of this thing and you know, the, you can always stop Conrad and think, well, this could have been done better. This could have been done differently. What, what that, but what different just have been better. I don't know that but what we were doing was working. It was no doubt working and working well. Uh, Andrew wants to know, does JR think there's any value in establishing a hierarchy in the roster? Kane was always a top guy, but unfortunately always seemed to run below Austin undertaker rock and triple H does JR think Kane could have made a event at a WrestleMania in a one-on-one -on -one match. You know, that's Absolutely. interesting. Cause I never really thought about that, but Kane never Absolutely. got it. Yeah. That's a no brainer to me. Mm -hmm. That's a no brainer to me, Conrad. It's just, yeah, no doubt about it. He could have headlined him. Uh, he could headline anything, but you know, you, you got to look at that roster at that same time. Uh, there's lots of star ta star talents, uh, that we were featuring. Everybody can't have the, the can't close the show. So, uh, but w w you want to close the show with strength and, and, uh, all that stuff. And we, and we had the roster to do that. Here's a great one from RCS 88. I've always heard the mania 14 match was supposed to be the end of the Kane character. What made management change their minds? You know, I don't know that to be true. I don't know that, that, that to be true. Uh, I haven't heard that conclusively. There's no reason to, uh, shut down the shop on a, on a, on a great character just because you got nothing else for him today. It's your job as creative to have something else for him today that leads to tomorrow. And, uh, so no, Kane was a star. We had made Kane and Kane and Taker more specifically and made themselves stars. And, uh, they just did a, they just were phenomenal. They just did great. Again, this is a, one of the greatest stories ever told. No doubt. In pro wrestling. Well, next week, Jim, we're going to be taking a look at survivor series, 1998. It'll be time for our 25 year look back at the WWF. Of course, this is highly regarded as one of the best pay-per-view storyline themed shows of all time. We're going to be taking a look at the rocks, Ascension corporate mankind, big boss man, Kane versus taker, and so much more next week here on the program. If you've got a question, it's easy to ask right now over Right. at JR grilling on Twitter, Instagram, over on Facebook, it's grilling JR. Uh, you can easily support the show too. throw us a subscription, hit that subscribe button over at grilling JR on youtube.com. Uh, we've also got some fun swag and merch over at grilling Uh, and of course, if you'd like to advertise on this program and you're looking for men, 25 to 54 years old, well, there's no better place to advertise than right here with us. Find out how affordable it is for your business and advertise with jr.com. But speaking of affordable, man, I got an important text message the other day from a friend of mine who lives out in Phoenix, Arizona, and he was visiting a friend of his who happens to be a wrestling fan. Shout out to miss Carla. 
and they had breakfast at Carla's home and Carla made our buddy out in uh, Arizona, some eggs and on those eggs, some JR's all purpose seasoning. He sent me a picture of the eggs and the text read, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. (laughs) People love the all purpose seasoning. And I know they hear me talk about it, but man, actually trying it, it is a game changer. Take Efren's word for it. Go out of your way to check it out. And there's something for everybody at jrsbbq.com. A couple of different types of sauce. You got the main event mustard. You got the Chipotle ketchup. You got JR's red ass hot sauce. Lots of other fun gifts like action figures, trading cards, something for everybody at jrsbbq.com. And a friend of mine, Jim, used to famously say it costs nothing to look. Not a damn thing. Hey, Conrad, another idea. Uh, JR's red ass uh, hot sauce. It, it goes great in scrambled eggs. Oh, I didn't think about that. It adds uh, or if you're making yourself an omelet, uh, the red has hot sauce, uh, fits really, really well. So we, and Venice has been good. We're, we're Venice has picked up, so it's all good. And next week we hope to have a lot of information here on the show regarding, uh, the book, a new book mm. and, uh, I'm going to try to we'll make sure we get a, uh, a, a coffee or a picture of the cover. I think people are going to really be, it's going to be it's a cool cover. So, uh, but we'll have a lot more information on the book and how you can order and where you can get it and all those good things. So, you know, our goal is to sell books and we hope that you guys will give it a shot. You've supported our book, uh, referendum very strongly since, uh, we started doing it. So, uh, We'll have more information on the book next week. So uh, be sure and check us out if nothing else for that. And, and, uh, and another hot show. Can't wait to, uh, to hear more about your new book and, uh, where we can see you and some of your upcoming appearances, of course, everywhere AEW goes for collision. You will be there. AEWTIX.com is where you can join in on all the action. And, uh, don't forget to pick up some swag from uh, jrsbbq.com and we'll be back next week, man. Talking about a very important, very special pay-per-view 25 years ago, survivor wow. series, 1998, right here on grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. I know it's a photo finish folks, but celebrity signings at sbcglobal.net is how you book me for appearances. Uh, so bull Ramos has got that information. Celebrity signings at sbcglobal.net. So uh, get a hold of Steve Wolf and he'll try to do some business with you. We'll make it happen and we'll bring JR to your neck of the woods sooner rather than later. In the meantime, see you next week, folks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. God bless you. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders. Plus new series like the book with David Crockett, Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch alongs, Q and A's and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And hey, when you do, the first week is completely free, adfreeshows.com.